What I'm going to be talking about is uh, uh, about uh, nylacast, about engineering polymers and uh, physical testing, and then the applications and uh, future developments, uh, which I'll be a bit coy about, and then uh, the conclusion and a very important point uh, I want to make. The uh, first box that I'm going to be looking at is basically about uh, nylacast. And uh, Nylacast was established in 1967. It was kind of a fairly small plastics business on an industrial estate until the uh, founder, Mike Fraser, um, developed the nylube and oilon form of uh, uh, plastics, which are the first intrinsically lubricated uh, plastic. So that it had the lubricant within the uh, plastic, uniformly dispersed and uh, so on. And uh, after that, it uh, grew and uh, to the size of about 400 people employed across the world. We have a uh, plant in uh, South Africa, which is very useful. We use the roof for um, uh, exposure to uh, the environment in their summer there, which is uh, useful. We um, have a warehouse and office operation in Pennsylvania. And we have, in 2010, we set up a uh, Houston office to deal with the oil and gas uh, developments. And uh, we export just under 80% of our produ pro production to about 43 countries. So, um, and uh, very shortly, we will be uh, covering a couple of those uh, spaces uh, there. So we are a truly international uh, company. And uh, what we have is a uh, variety of materials, which uh, the white stuff at the uh, bottom there is um, the uh, original nylon cast uh, uh, PA6. And then at the uh, uh, then we have the nylu, which is the red material, which has a very low coefficient of friction of about uh, 0.08. Then oilon, the green material, is the intermediate uh, friction, about 0.16. The uh, yellow stuff is called aquanile, and uh, that is for um, uh, exposure to water applications. The uh, blue stuff is called uh, HS blue. Uh, which is heat stabilized blue for uh, higher temperature applications. Uh, the black material is, uh, is, contains molybdenum disulfide as a solid lubricant. And uh, at the bottom, uh, right at the bottom, there's uh, some impact modified material, which is used obviously for uh, specific applications. Um, one of the things is that we uh, are very much a engineering components plastic uh, company and uh, we have complete traceability. We make our own nylon right from the monomer through to the final nylon and we've got complete traceability from the raw chemi chemicals coming in, the monomer, the uh, uh, activator, the catalyst and we can do anything from one-offs to uh, high volume, something like uh, 50,000, 60,000 a year and so on. And uh, one of the things is that we are fascinated by the engineering aspect and we have full engineering solutions including the design, the testing, the material certification which I'll go into later on and we, we would work with dedicated uh, project teams. Uh, Research and development is uh, my responsibility and for a relatively small firm of about 400 people we have full in-house um, research development and testing facilities uh, firstly for development and uh, but also for uh, quality control, quality assurance and we develop uh, new materials and uh, we can come up, if you come and talk to us, we can come up with a custom formulation for the, your specific uh, application. And uh, we uh, tick all the quality boxes and really work at it. Uh, you can see there the uh, uh, most recent one at the bottom is associated with the oil and gas industry, but uh, all our apparatus is uh, uh, calibrated uh, to UCAS standard by UCAS uh, engineers. And uh, the applications are many and varied. We're always interested in new ones, but the first block there really are, are concerned with uh, mainly transport of materials, either in um, uh, trucks, dumper trucks, and applications in that, or in, um, uh, for instance, in the, in the marine oil gas offshore. We'll see some examples later on where we uh, 
are involved in pipelines, in specific ap applications for um, uh, control valves and so on. And then there's the pharmaceutical food and beverage, really that's uh, packaging at the bottom. Automotive, we're uh, very big into electric uh, power steering systems, uh, which um, are growing very, very rapidly on small and now into uh, moderate sized vehicles. Um, waste management, uh, all the, when you see the wheelie bins being lifted up and tipped up, in, they must, the, uh, the actual works run in tracks, and those tracks are uh, usually our nylu, uh, apper, apper, um, uh, nylon. And uh, our customers, well, we have uh, CAT, uh, Money2, which is the French equivalent of JCB, if you don't then say it in France, um, but JCB, mainly to do with their um, uh, construction equipment, but also with things called telehandlers. And we come back uh, to that. But uh, we, put, we provide the bearing surfaces for the extending booms and uh, the, for a telehandler. Now, a telehandler, the limit, is a big truck. It goes up to a laden uh, container, shipping container, 40 tons, lifts it, and then retracts. Now, you imagine the turning forces in those uh, booms. Um, it's got to be able to uh, retract. And uh, the, uh, we work with Shell and uh, BP, mainly in uh, uh, offshore uh, pipelines and so on, which we'll illustrate later on. And then Fiat. Fiat, um, we were the, they were the first people to put our um, uh, electric power steering system components into the uh, Punto about 12 years ago. And so on. And this replaces the hydraulic um, uh, power steering system because um, hydraulic power steering systems are energy inefficient because you only use the energy when you want to change course. With the electric power steering system, you only use energy when you want to. Uh, of course, and these are taking over the small and medium vehicle area. Um, well, why use uh, the uh, nylocast nylon? Well, there's an in increased component life, obviously. There's zero corrosion, providing you don't expose it to anything below pH 1 or above pH 13, it will be very, 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 very stable. Uh, stable to almost all uh, solvents. I've yet to find a solvent which will dissolve, uh, well I do know of some, but I, I won't let on. We use those for analytical purposes. Um, I mean, if those kind of solvents, you'd uh, kind of go into battle, were completely set up with uh, protective gear, so they're not in normal use. Um, they, they weigh less, they dampen the noise, and uh, you can have an internal lubrication, as we said with the uh, Nylube and the uh, Oilon. And if you've got this internal lubrication, what will happen is that uh, uh, you will get reduced ab abrasion. Um, when you consider things like uh, the printing of um, what is normally called Coke cans, but basically all the aluminium cans, they go onto a mandrel and they go around the Geneva wheel and they print onto that. Now they've got to have a certain amount of adhesion. Now as they're whizzing on and off, they print, they're doing about 100 and, 110 or something like that a minute. You can imagine there's wear. And the brass mandrels used to last about uh, uh, a week. When they put uh, oil on uh, mandrels on, they lasted something like uh, six weeks. And when they put the nylube nylub mandrels on, they lasted uh, six months. So you can imagine that uh, the people making these, uh, using these um, mandrels for printing purposes were very happy. And um, so obviously we've got chemical resistance, abrasion resistance, so we're going to have reduced maintenance costs and reduced m machine downtime. And of course there's ever, production is everything. So, uh, the so in this um, block, what I'm going to be talking about is engineering polymers. Um, this is the kind of ubiquitous uh, uh, polymer uh, triangle. It's been used um, it's, uh, many, many times. And what I want, particularly want to uh, point out is that the, uh, get this thing to work, that the, uh, at this level you've got the uh, commodity polymers like uh, polyethylene, polypropylene, um, ABS, etc. And uh, they are useful up to about, um, as a group, up to about 100 degrees C, often less. Um, on the right hand side, what we've got here is a kind of a rough uh, cost guide. It's geometric, one pound, 10 pound, 100 pounds a kilo, roughly. So um, 
what happens in is the what are called the engineering polymers, and uh, these um, uh, will include nylon, they include PET, PBT, polyethylene tetrathalate, etc. And then you start getting into the exotic polymers. Um, some of these, like Peak up there, um, Peak in many ways is the ideal polymer, except the price, <laughs> and uh, because you're looking at above 100 pound a kilogram. And um, one of the problems, of course, is that as you go up here, um, higher temperatures, higher temperature for the engineering plastics, um, continuous will be, say, around about 150, and then you get up to, say, 300 degrees C here. What you've got is that you have increasing difficulty of um, processing and uh, increased pressure, increased temperature, and so on. Um, the point that uh, we particularly make about uh, PA6 is that it can be cast. It's one of the few polymers which can actually be cast. You melt the monomer, the monomer melts to a water clear liquid uh, around about 69, 70. Uh, you put in all the additives, which we'll come to in a minute, stir it up, and then you put in the catalyst and you put in the uh, uh, activator. And uh, within five minutes, you've got a gel phase. Within 20 minutes, you've got a hot solid and so on. I mean, it comes to that later on. Now, the other problem is that other plastics need to be extruded or injection molded, and that gives a size limit. And uh, if you go to this, you can see our, our wee helmet there, and uh, wee helmet is about 5 foot 10, and uh, it was just uh, 1.75 uh, 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 meters, and that is obviously a, uh, a big sheave, um, a big pulley, which goes on mining equipment, and uh, we can go up to um, three meter diameter. We can machine, we can cast it up to three meters, we can machine it up to three meters, and so on. And on the right hand side, you can see that there's various, um, uh, various um, uh, bearings. There's a large bearing, then there's a little bearing, then there's a smaller bearing, there's a tiny bearing and, uh, on top. So we can really um, articulate size and so on. Now, um, we, there's a cast nylon six. That's generally a nearly white, creamy material. And we can put in additives, which can reduce friction. They can be, uh, reduce degradation. And the friction, to start off with the uh, friction coefficient, the friction coefficient for cast nylon is between 0 0.3 and 0 0.4. Depends how you measure it, depends how hard you push, what weight you put on it, what speed, and so on. And the friction coefficient for um, the Nylu premium product is 0 0.08. And uh, that is um, used extensively in the um, uh, construction industry for the booms and the retracting booms and so on. And uh, so what we've done with cast nylon, it brings together these kind of good physical properties of tensile, flexural, compression and impact at a low cost. And that uh, the maximum continuous operating temperature is 100, 110, depending on the grade. And uh, we're working on extending that. Uh, the main issue with that is to protect the nylon against atmospheric oxidation and degradation. And, uh, we, uh, the maximum occasional excursion temperature, we would say is 170, 180, to according to the grade. And the uh, standard semi-finished rod and plate we can sell, but mainly we sell engineering um, uh, machined components, uh, like <coughs> this. <laughs> it started off as a tube. And you can see that uh, what we've got is um, a very high degree of uh, uh, CNC machining on that and we can produce very, very complex uh, shapes and uh, structures and so on. Um, we can easily cast uh, large and or complex shapes. I mean, said that we can go up to three meters. Nobody's ever asked to go beyond two and a half meters. But if you've got something you want to go up to three meters, or maybe four, we will be interested in uh, looking at it. Um, one of the ways in which you can alter the um, uh, properties with additives is shown here. The um, column there is the uh, properties of the uh, standard cast nylon 6. And it's uh, creamy white, it's FDA, EU approved for food contact and so on. 
Um, the Nilu, what we have done is basically kept those properties, but what we have done is to uh, change the friction coefficient from 0.3 to 0.4 to 0.08 and so on. Now the impact, we have, uh, it will slightly decrease the uh, uh, tensile strength, but what we've done from the impact, uh, we've changed it from 4.5 to 6 uh, kilojoules per meter squared to 13, and we can go more than that and so on. Um, so we uh, just want to uh, look at it. Um, so really, it's uh, what we've done over the years um, is to uh, evolve a, our own sources of the uh, catalyst, which is made in one country. The um, activator is from another source. And what we've done is to make a unique polymer with a very high molecular weight for its class. In fact, we, uh, we sponsor a um, molecular weight determination exercise at one of the local universities and uh, every year. And uh, what we feel, we think we have one of the highest molecular weight nylons uh, on the market. And that gives um, particular resilience to the uh, material. So, as design engineers, what we uh, would like you to come along to Nylacast and ask us for specific and special combinations of the strength you want, the property you want, where you're going to put it, and so on. And uh, so I've more or less covered that. So uh, we go on to the next one. And uh, to give you an idea of the physical testing, um, every time we cast, what happens is that we get a, uh, an exotherm and the material goes in at that uh, uh, the origin there. The temperature drops because it goes into a uh, cooler mold and then the polymerization starts and it accelerates up there and what will happen is it's, uh, life is fantastic because there's uh, unlimited monomer so it's called radical iron and it's kind of uh, growing and growing and then of course it reaches a stage where it's limited in the amount of uh, monomer there and, it's, and the reaction slows down and goes over the top. And uh, what we have is a point of inflection uh, there and uh, what we uh, can see that in the first derivative there and the point is that all of our casts are uh, monitored in this way. We obtain the exotherm and it's archived. Now, uh, if you come, come back to us and say we want the same material or whatever, we can always retrieve that from our archive. We have um, a, uh, that's obviously a, an, an Instron um, tensile tester. We can do um, tensile impact, uh, impact and um, compression and flexural. We have additional fixtures where we can do uh, strange pushings off and pullings and uh, so on. And it's all um, serviced and accredited by UCAS uh, engineers. And that feeds through to the certificate of analysis of each batch. And uh, what the things there we can, you know, you can ask for those. It might cost you a little, but uh, we will be prepared to give you a certificate of analysis for each batch of your material. Uh, one of the things I feel that the uh, plastics industry is a bit remiss on is that you can, as design engineers, you can uh, ask for a data sheet and that, you'll get a data sheet and that's what it is, uh, what, it, what it should be. What you actually get may be different and uh, we feel that if you are making something which is of in, uh, a an important component, a crucial component, and in the automotive uh, applications that we make, um, 30 to 40, 50,000 a week, um, safety critical issues, then each one of you need a certificate of analysis for each batch, which is totally uh, traceable. Um, obviously you don't need it if you're making buckets and spades out of recycled polyethylene for Tesco's, but for the kind of things that you're putting in and some of the applications that you will see. Um, we, um, as part of the contract, we uh, supply a certificate of analysis for each batch. Now, we come to some applications. Um, this is, these are the kind of telehandlers. These are the uh, things which um, have extending booms and they have different things on the end. They reach out and uh, grab things or dig things and so on. One on the left, in, uh, sorry, one on the right you will recognize as JCB. Um, 
or a cat collar, the one on the left is uh, French Manitou. But if you look at the gaps there, you will just see the uh, red Nilu sliders, and they're in there as well, etc. And um, so what will happen is that uh, as the boom slides out, it will be supported on these um, Nilu sliders. Um, and it, uh, an example of how we work with the uh, design engineers, um, these, you may, if you think back, these used to be plain metal. And then it became fashionable for them to uh, paint them. And uh, what happened was that we had to uh, change the formulation of the, of the wear pad to uh, deal with the sliding load on a painted surface as distinct from a sliding load on a steel surface. And it, has, and it had its problems, so I, I will add. Um, this uh, takes into account the compressive strength, the lightness, and the, um, uh, the corrosion resistance, because all of these are associated with uh, uh, sea or seaside activities. The one on the right there, that is um, the hoist arrangement for the kind of uh, spindly spider type things which go around at dockside and pick up um, pick up the uh, 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 big containers and pick them up and move them across, put them on lorries and uh, so on. So um, the uh, black uh, uh, sheaves or pulleys there. The yellow one is for uh, yachting applications and small ship applications, particularly because this, uh, the yellow material has um, uh, better qualities of, uh, of resisting water absorption. These um, are used on oil and gas production and exploration rigs, and they're used for, um, and they, we should have put somebody beside it, but they're about um, 1.2, 1.5 meters high and they use for lifting uh, apparatus on um, uh, the oil and gas rigs and so on. Um, this one's an interesting one we use, uh, uh, you don't normally see this because it's hidden, um, high tensile strength. Down the middle of that is a uh, nylon six rod and uh, one end would be uh, cast into a uh, prefabricated uh, concrete structure. And then at the other end, there would, uh, there would be uh, that. And you just bring them together as um, kind of ratcheted, um, ratcheted devices, which will hold a structure, a um, prefabricated concrete structures together. And uh, the small one of these will hold uh, about six tons. The big one will hold nine tons. We put an array of those around the periphery, bring it together. It's not going to come apart readily. Uh, this is an interesting one. Um, what we have here is the uh, extension to Felixstowe Harbour. These are piles. They are steel tubes. They are 37 feet, so 37 metres long and about 3 metres in diameter. And uh, what happens is that they uh, are whacked into the ground by a pile driver. And uh, what um, they the standard used to be something like 13 tonnes dropping a metre about every 10 seconds and the industry uh, started to uh, want to go faster so they went up to um, 20 tonnes dropping one and a half metre less than every 10 seconds. And if you work it out that's about 6 kilowatts continuous and uh, so these um, uh, piling dollies sit on, uh, sit on top of a cap which goes on top of these uh, piles and, the, and they absorb the uh, energy. What we found was that when the industry went to the higher uh, weights or, and more frequent and longer drops, um, we started to get some failures. So what we did was to, um, uh, to uh, look at the formulation. We looked at the um, coefficient the here of um, restitution we changed the formulation and we changed the way in which they are operated. I have to say that we shot ourselves in the foot here. We made them so successful that we sold less because they lasted longer. So that's a classic example, uh, perhaps unfortunate, of uh, how we can interact with the piling engineers and make things uh, better. 
we'll come to pipelines in a minute, but this is a, once they've made a pipeline, um, they've got to kind of deliver it to the sea floor. And what they do is to uh, basically wind it up on a big barge. And uh, what we have here is these um, kind of uh, pulleys, very flat pulleys. And what they are is they stand about uh, uh, 1.2 meters high. And uh, what we've got is they're very light. They are self-lubricated. There's no maintenance needed. And there's lo low, very low abrasion and low friction as they wind this uh, pipeline onto it. And they take it out to sea and then they unwind it onto the sea floor. This is a, uh, a real pipeline and uh, shows the internal structure. For subsea pipelines, um, that is the actual pipeline in there, and that contains the gas or the oil, and that is the protective pipeline on the outside. And uh, we've got to stop these two uh, coming together, so we put these collars around. Now, um, putting a collar around might seem fairly simple. The uh, problem is that uh, we were required to produce a low friction ring so that the uh, thermal changes between the inner and outer meant that the, the inner pipeline could slide relative to the outer pipeline. Um, we soon found that if we did that, um, there was, uh, these tended to end up like a uh, pearls on a string, or tended to end up at one end. Therefore, what we did was to um, develop a patented process working with the pipeline engineers to uh, put a uh, metal um, material of a very, very high friction coefficient. There's one on the stand over there. It's the kind of green half hoop. Um, and uh, when that's um, bolted up, torqued up, what will happen is it's extremely difficult to shift these, extremely difficult. So what we've achieved here is a low friction on the outside so that these two pipes can slide relative to each other, but a very high friction uh, connection on the inside so that thing isn't going to move. And uh, one of the, uh, this is an example of the high coefficient of restitution of the uh, of nylon. Um, those of you who have been to the National Railway Museum will recognize that as the original uh, Shinkansen um, Japanese bullet train. Once they came to the end of life on the uh, Japanese system, what they did was to um, start distributing them around the world um, as one way of getting rid of them. And uh, they gave one to the National Railway Museum. Of course, it's too big, the, tr the um, track's too wide, the, gu the gauge is too wide for it to go on ours. So it had to go on the low loader, which you can just see the wheels there, and so on. Of course, it had to be lifted off. Um, so you have these big trains. The point for our product is that uh, it's got these crane pads here without which those jacks would go through the asphalt and, uh, as it lifted. And uh, an example, the uh, kind of thing that we produce is uh, little ones called little foot and big ones called big foot. But the important thing is that we put one on a uh, between two books of timber, put a weight on it, and you can see that it bends, doesn't break. You take that off and it comes back to its original, sh uh, original shape. So it's got a very high coefficient of uh, restitution. Um, so future developments. Um, we're working on uh, even lower friction coefficients. Um, to a certain extent, it's a race to the bottom. Who can get the lowest friction coefficient and so on? We're already selling stuff at 0 0.08. We uh, know we can halve that and uh, probably go uh, even lower. Higher strength material, dramatically higher strength material, will uh, eventually um, come to the market within the next uh, six, nine months. Um, enhanced resistance to environmental degradation. That's where, for instance, any plastic put on top of a crane in a desert, in a mining uh, application, will start to degrade. It will lose its color, it will start to crack, and then it will fall apart. And that's what we have to um, uh, counteract and uh, what we've managed to do is to um, working with our South African people because they've got an ideal environment to test it to uh, get uh, plastics, uh, nylon, which will uh, last a very, very long time in very strong, adverse UV, uh, low humidity environments. High visibility colours for health and safety. It might seem easy, but the um, 
the colours which are used for um, high visibility vests and uh, so on, um, they are very, very delicate chemicals. And you try and put them in a plastic and you put in what you hope is going to be a very interesting colour and it comes out differently. And we have eventually found um, several um, high visibility colours. And they're used, for instance, in um, oil and gas so that we make the oil and gas components which are on the sea floor. Um, you're probably aware of those um, unmanned things. They're rather like helicopters without the blades, which kind of come down and look around with head, um, headlights on. They need to uh, uh, see these things as soon as possible. So therefore, we've got a range of high visibility colors which we can apply across the range if you need to find the component uh, in the Merck. <laughs> And the, uh, under the sea. So basically we've got uh, specific polymer grades for uh, more demanding specific industries and we're interested in talking to you. So one, a final point. The uh, engineering plastic design is only going to be successful if the plastic manufacturer, which is us, and the design engineers, which are basically yourselves, come together, work together for an engineering solution. I would add one uh, codicil to that, and that is, um, it's very important if your material is going into a demanding application, you should get a certificate of analysis so you know what you're getting instead of just a, uh, something which vaguely um, approximates to a data sheet. So, thank you for coming along, thank you for listening.